wanting to help. So stick around. Uh, we'll have that meeting. We're going to talk about uh, kind of what VBS looks like this year. Uh, and, and, and hopefully we can, we can pray over that uh, and just be prepared for the week to come. Um, if you look over to uh, the, the left side of your uh, bulletin, there's a big blue square that just has a little excerpt in here about some things that we need for VBS. Uh, we are looking for sleeping bags for uh, small fake pine trees uh, and hiking type of backpacks. So if you have those items, uh, we're just asking if you can bring them tonight uh, or at least by church next Sunday morning. Uh, after service, they're going to get started on decorating. How many sleeping bags do you need? How many sleeping bags do you need? Where's is this? Karen? We need probably a dozen. Mm -hmm. A dozen. We need a dozen sleeping bags. And if there's more, you know, we can leave them rolled up. <laughs> All right. So if you keep those things in your in, in mind, you know, if you guys are available for VBS, definitely stick around and hang out for that meeting. Uh, it'll be exciting three days up here at the church. Uh, there's also some uh, some meetings coming up this week. Uh, and after service, there's a benevolence offering that will be collected. So uh, have your, your money ready for that. The deacons will be uh, at the back of the as you leave. With that, let's bow our heads and we'll pray uh, as we get started this morning. Uh, I guess one more announcement. I know everybody looks down and I make more fun. Uh, Monday, we are going to be doing concessions again, so tomorrow evening at the ball fields. Uh, we, had, we were crazy busy on Thursday, way busier than we had been before uh, with being tournament week. Uh, so if anybody wants to come out and help with that uh, tomorrow evening, um, games are starting, I believe, at 530. So I'm going to try to be there sometime between 5 and 530. So if you want to come out, uh, hang out and help. It was a really good time, but we were very busy last week. So we'd love, we'd love an extra set of hands. With that, let's bow our heads. And we'll really pray this time, I promise. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this wonderful morning, uh, for this great time uh, that we can gather to, to worship you. Uh, God, I just pray that each and every one of us, Lord, that we put aside the distractions in our lives and uh, in our minds, God, that we just focus our attention, we focus our hearts uh, on worship, uh, that we just focus on worshiping you today. Uh, Lord, we just thank you, we praise you, and we love you. Amen. As we get ready to go into the
God, because you are the name that is above every name. You are the King of kings. You are the Prince of peace. You are the Lord of lords. You are great and marvelous. And so, God, may the time that we spend in worship, here in corporate worship on Sunday mornings, may it be practiced, may it be joining in with what is already taking place for eternity. God, your word says that though even the rocks cry out, God, may we be louder than those rocks. Because, God, you came to save us. And because of that, we are forever grateful. And you deserve our praise. So, God, I pray that this morning you are enthroned by the praises of your people. We love you, God. Amen. Before you sit down and as the choir is coming down, please take a moment to greet each other and welcome each other to church this morning. everybody is uh, making their way back to their seats this morning, we're going to uh, make a transition toward communion, and I'm going to ask our deacons to go ahead and make their way to the front, and as they're doing that, um, I just had two things that I wanted to mention, Austin covered all of our announcements, but um, something I would ask you to be in prayer for this week. Uh, among many other things, is it is Camp Echo Week, uh, and I know Todd, wherever he just went, Todd's super excited about that. So we always pray for for him and all of the other campers. We have um, a lot of counselors and folks as well that are involved in that, and it's just a great week. So we want to be in prayer for that. On a lighter side. Um, if you've been in the cafe, most of you probably have been this morning. Um, we need to pray for Scott. <laughs> Scott, um, Scott has uh, unfortunately had to buy a house in Ohio. <laughs> and so he's, he's officially a Buckeye. <laughs> 
I'm sorry for changing the mood in the room. But this is serious, folks. He, um, that comes with a uh, free windshield pass to drive slow in the passing lane. I'm sorry. Anyway, there are many, many serious things that we need to be in prayer for. Um, and I'm glad we can be light and, and fellowship. We can take a moment and, and, and laugh. Even in the face of things that are causing us uh, a lot of worry and turmoil. And so, gentlemen, if you would go ahead and come forward. We're going to enter into a time of communion, which we should never, never, never take lightly. This opportunity that we have to remember, to remember the past, to remember in the present, to remember in the future what Christ's sacrifice means to us. I'm going to ask if, uh, if there's anybody who did not receive their communion elements when they came in this morning. If you would raise your hand, um, we can make sure that somebody gets this to you. Looks like we're in good shape. A.T. Pearson said once he was a, a well-known author and preacher as well as a missionary. And he said this. He said that the link between the cross and the crown... The link between the cross and the crown is the table of Jesus Christ. So never forget, when we sit down and we do communion, that the bread and the cup both point back to what Jesus willingly did for us on the cross. And at the same time, looking backward at that accomplishment, they point forward to his accomplished mission in the future that we have in heaven, our salvation. We are told that on the night in which our Savior was betrayed, that he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he said, this is my body, which was broken for you. Heavenly Father, as we partake, We are part of his body, which was broken for us. Christ said, do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup. And he reminded his disciples that this was not a cup of mere refreshment, but that it was a cup of sacrifice. His blood, a new covenant. His blood poured out willingly for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your Son, Christ Jesus, who died upon the cross. We do not presume to come to your table trusting in our own righteousness, but in your mercy. We thank you for Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Jesus said, drink, do this also in remembrance of me. Scriptures tell us that when they had finished with supper, they, they walked to the Mount of Olives, to the garden, and therefore, uh, and they sang a, a hymn on their way. And therefore, in that tradition, we like to sing this hymn together in a sense of fellowship and communion. Thank you, gentlemen. As our deacons are uh, going back at this time, if you are in kindergarten through fifth grade, I'd like to dismiss you for Children's Church. At this time, you can follow Tracy. I see her in the back. Thank you, Tracy. And I would like to, at this time, ask our ushers to come forward and receive this morning's offering.
pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning. We pray that you would bless these tithes and these offerings, Lord, as we give back to you, as we give back to you cheerfully, with good spirit, Lord, and faithfully, as you have given to us so abundantly. Lord, that we would use our time, our talent, and our treasure according to your will, Lord, and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, gentlemen. that better? Okay. Technical error. It's not always their fault. <laughs> Normally. What I was saying is this morning, I'm, you know, I tried as much as I challenge everyone else around me not to get stuck into patterns or to be willing to at least change and look at doing things differently. Um, I, I challenge myself in the same way. So I'm going to start this morning. We're going we're gonna to go straight to the scripture. So I'm going to ask you, if you would, to turn your Bibles, if you'd like to, to follow me in Psalms 51, and we're going to look at verses 16 and 17. I'll give you just a second there to get with me. I usually give you more time to prepare. Psalm 51, 16 and 17 says this. This is David, okay, talking uh, to God. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you would bless this reading of your word, Lord, that you would open the ears and the hearts this morning that need to hear from you. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. So this morning, let's talk about compassion. Let's talk about compassion, right? We could all use a little compassion. I'm sure that we feel that way, and I would also 
say to myself, we could all, and to all of you, we could all show a little more compassion. C.S. Lewis said once, he said, pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our consciences, but shouts in our pain. Pain is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Last week, I stressed to you the importance or the, uh, at least an emphasis on the, the point that true discipleship and the Holy Spirit go hand in hand. They work hand in hand together. That without the Holy Spirit, there's no discipleship. And without discipleship and the Holy Spirit working together, there's no church. And without the church, how do we accomplish the mission that he's given us? Can you hear the pleading in my words? Can you hear the pleading as, as I'm speaking to you about this? Do you feel any conviction in your heart about what kind of disciple you are? Do you feel any conviction in your heart about how the Holy Spirit is working in you, how it's working through you? Do you feel any conviction as to whether it's happening at all? Now, this may sound strange, but I, I think in the context of compassion and what we're talking about, what I'm trying to challenge you, challenge you about no truer words have been spoken than these. In, in order to grow, right, in order to really grow in our discipleship, three things have to happen. It's simple. Three things. We have to learn, we have to unlearn, and we have to relearn. Right? Learn, unlearn, and relearn, and then repeat over and over again. That's where growth and discipleship happen. Paul said it this way in Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. He said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable. That's holy with an H, not holy with a W. Holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Reasonable and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by what? By the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Jesus Christ said it this way, quite simply in Matthew 16. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. What are they saying? What are they saying? If we can deny ourselves, if we can allow the Holy Spirit to work in us and through us, to do the work that the Lord has planned for us, can you imagine for a second what He might do? The great works that He might do in us and through us. But what will it take? What's it going to take? For most of us, and even as we read the Bible, for most of the folks in our Bible stories, it takes complete and total brokenness and humility. That's what it takes to get there. David, as I mentioned already, is speaking to God. He's talking about God in this prayer, this psalm that he's written. For you do not desire sacrifice or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. Again, for most of us, it takes a complete brokenness and humility, just like David. The, word, the world, I'm sorry, is searching 
The world is searching for an answer, right? We have the answer. You have the answer that they're searching for. It's compassion. Compassion. Jesus epitomizes compassion. We find Jesus. We find compassion at the intersection of brokenness and humility. That's where we find them. The New Testament word for compassion is the same word that was used for guts. The same word for compassion is the same word for guts. You know when we say we have a gut feeling? The word is actually sponsna. It's where we get the word spleen. I'm looking at my medical people. They probably knew that. But it's the word that's used as compassion. It's the type of compassion for suffering and for pain and seeing people hurt. And, and the love for people that, that comes from physically deep within us. It's not superficial. It, it's from inside. We feel it in our guts. Jesus had Swanchna compassion for people. He saw their suffering. He felt it in his gut. And it moved him to act. It wasn't just a feeling. Compassion isn't just a feeling. It's a physical response. It's an action. David finds himself... In this psalm, he finds himself at this very intersection of brokenness and humility. He's just been confronted by Nathan about his affair with Bathsheba. And David is repentant, truly repentant about his sin. At this moment, he's at this intersection. He's experiencing both complete and total brokenness and complete humility. Before God. And God is merciful. In God. At this intersection. David finds compassion. We learn from the psalmist. What, is, what it is that truly pleases God. More than sacrifices. More than burnt offerings. Is a humble heart. A humble heart that looks to God. When the troubles and the challenges are overwhelming and crushing us. A humble heart that pleads out of that humility. Prays for his mercy and forgiveness. In the larger context, the problem here was never that Israel hadn't offered enough burnt offerings or made enough sacrifices. The, the problem was that Israel was tempted to think of itself or think that the sacrifices were what was the first priority or the most important thing to God. As though somehow God was dependent upon our sacrifices. That's not the point. What God wanted from Israel, what He wants from David, what He wants from each of us is to acknowledge that we need Him. That we have to have Him in our lives. He wants us to give thanks, to rejoice in all things. To pray to Him without ceasing, especially when we are in need. He wants us to know that we need Him. Broken and humble. God doesn't want your confession. He knows your sins. He already knows. God wants repentance. He wants a change of mind, right? He wants a change of mind and a change of heart that's so profound it changes your behavior. God wants you to be transformed. A new creation. He wants then our obedience to His will. If the Spirit is in us, we are a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Right? 
That's what Scripture promises us. For most of us, we tend to begin our own personal journey at that intersection of brokenness and humility, just like David. Now we call that journey, this journey of becoming Christ-like, we call that, we refer to it as sanctification. It's a lifelong process of becoming, key word, becoming, a process of becoming more like Christ. When we talk about compassion, it's about how this work of becoming is done in the, this present life, in this world. Where we're foreigners. It's about how we work and become like Christ in this world, in our present life. How the work is done for and by human beings who are seeking to become more like Jesus. Kind of like learning, unlearning, and relearning. Right? In a more religious sense, it's a four-step process, this sanctification. And I'm not going to expound on both, on all four. Okay? But I want you to remember these steps of sanctification. It starts with information. Right? We get information like a child. The first things that we receive from God. We learn. We take in information. That leads to the second thing, which is reformation. We are reformed also. I'll I'll stick with the analogy to a child. It's like being corrected by God. He's making a moral investment in us and we're starting to learn. Next comes transformation. Transformation. So if if we go through reformation, we're reformed, God's giving us new marching orders, then transformation becomes reformation in action. Does that make sense? Reformation plus action. Listen, God's going to talk to us however He needs to talk to us. Each of us in a different way. God comes to us, visits, gets in our head, gets in our heart, walks in front of us. You know, I told you the story about the guy headbutting me. That's what it took for me. Right. Smacks you with a two by four. We're all different. And God is going to speak to you however He needs to get to you. I heard the analogy here. Whether, whether you're on the on-ramp or even as you're going down the road and you're passing mile marker after mile marker after mile marker, God is going to continue to speak to you and transform you. Ultimately, we get to formation. This is where we have to get to. This is where we're constantly striving and working to be. Formation is entirely the work of the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit working in us, through us, around us, leading us to be more like Christ. The point is, as we start to look outward, as I've been preaching about mission, right? And what we need to do to take the Spirit and share it with others. The message is, we can't, we can't lead someone to formation. That's the Holy Spirit's job. But we can't lead anyone there or help if we're not there. We can't teach people to be compassionate beyond our own level of compassion. So what are the conditions of our formation? Well, I I don't know. The only one I know for sure is the Holy Spirit. We first have to have the presence of the Holy Spirit. Beyond that, God's in control. The conditions are we submit to His will. I've heard it said that the Holy Spirit... With respect to the Holy Spirit, some things aren't taught, they're caught. I can't teach you about it. You've got to catch it. I saw saw a a meme video, whatever, yesterday. It was kind of funny. It said, here's here's a Baptist being moved by the Spirit. It was 30 seconds of a guy just 
There was all kinds of great praise music going. People were jumping and shouting all around them. It's okay. God will speak to you how he's going to speak to you. The flesh says self-preservation, right? The flesh speaks to us about self-preservation. Aside from the Holy Spirit, the only condition of formation that, that I think is relevant and important is that we have to die to ourselves. We have to deny ourselves. We have to get out of the way. That's that guy. He's in the way. Right? The guy in that video, he's just blocking. We've got to get out of the way. Paul says this. I mentioned the flesh says self-preservation. Paul says, I die daily. I die daily. We have to get to the point, we have to get to the level where we present ourselves as a living sacrifice. We have to get to the point where we're incapable of saying no to God. We have to deny ourselves and follow Him. We have to be broken and humble. Sacrifice. In the psalm, the psalmist is talking about sacrifice. What is, what is God asking us to give back? What is He asking of us? What is He asking from us? Think, think for a minute about Abraham and, and, and Hannah comes to mind, right? When she's given Samuel to the priest. We talked last week about Moses. What, is, what was God asking of, of Moses? But this morning I want to ask, what is God asking of you? What's he asking from you? Or maybe instead think about what is, what is he asking of you that, and you're doing something different. He's asking you to do something and you're doing what you want to do. What is someone else having to sacrifice because you won't? What is someone else having to sacrifice because you're doing what you want to do instead of what God's asking you to do? Don't let someone else sacrifice in your place. Show some compassion. That's a different way to be compassionate, to be obedient, and do what God is asking. Do what the Spirit is moving you to do. In the psalm, we see the sacrifices of God. We find His compassion at the intersection of David's brokenness and humility. Both, right? Not one or the other, both. Our suffering may be required, but... In and of itself, our suffering and our pain is it's insufficient. It's not enough. We have to have a humble heart. Think about the two thieves on the cross. Think again about Hannah. Think about Job praying for his friends. Think about Jonah praying in the belly of a whale. Right? It wasn't just about their pain. It wasn't just about their suffering. It was about their humble heart. It was about them reaching out. In that brokenness, reaching out to God. God doesn't oppose the sinner in that way. He shows mercy to them. What God opposes is our pride. God opposes the proud. And even still, He extends grace. Thank goodness. With the Holy Spirit in us, when it comes to compassion, we are both agents and recipients. We are both. We, we give compassion and we receive compassion. God doesn't change. He never changes. But, but when we receive His compassion and when we share it, it requires change. It requires change 
from both parties, from the giver and from the receiver. The recipient obviously is in need. There's a problem. They need, they require some compassion. But did you ever think that the, when you give it, God also knows that there's a reason you need to exercise in giving that compassion? He's working on both at the same time. Don't overlook that. He's amazing in that way. Author and theologian Howard Thurman said this about Jesus' humanity and his humiliation. Natural humiliation was hurting and burning. And the balm for that burning humiliation was humility. Listen to this. For humility cannot be humiliated. Humility cannot be humiliated. He goes on to say, thus Jesus asked his people to learn from him. What did he say? For I am meek and lowly of heart. David found compassion at the intersection of brokenness and humility. We will find compassion at the intersection of brokenness and humility. You will meet Jesus at the intersection of brokenness and humility. And in the very compassion that we find in him, we also find hope. We find hope. The awareness, Thurman wrote, that a man is a child of God who is at one and the same time the God of life creates such a profound faith in life that nothing can destroy it. Of course God cares for the grass of the field which lives a day and is no more or the sparrow that falls unnoticed by the wayside. He also holds the stars in their appointed places, leaves his mark on every living thing, and he cares for me. And he cares for you. That same God. Let us humble ourselves this morning before God. In our brokenness, let us show humility. Let us find and share his compassion there. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come this morning with hearts filled with gratitude and, and love, Lord, knowing that you are the God, the God of compassion. Lord, of comfort, Lord, our refuge. Your word reminds us of your unwavering love and care for your children. Lord, we thank you for the reassurance that when we cry out to you, that you hear us. Lord, your promise to deliver us from all our troubles, it fills us with hope, Lord, and trust. In our moments of distress, Lord, when our spirits feel crushed and our hearts are broken, Lord, we feel your presence so strongly in those moments. We feel you draw beside us. Thank you. Thank you for being close in our brokenheartedness, Lord, and for saving us when we're crushed in spirit. Lord, your love and your compassion is our strength. It's our courage. We praise you and we thank you for being the God of compassion, the God of all comfort. And Lord, this morning I pray that in turn that we would be a source of comfort and compassion to others, that we would share the very comfort and compassion, Lord, that we receive from you with those who are also in need. Lord, we find peace and security in you. We commit our lives and our work to you, to your mission. Lord, knowing that you and you alone are our salvation. 
We pray for your love. We pray for your grace that it would guide us every day and through all of our days, Lord, as we just seek to become more like you. Lord, to be a vessel filled and overflowing with your love and compassion. Lord, as someone needs to know you as their Lord and Savior, as someone needs to rededicate themselves to a closer walk and a deeper relationship with you, Lord, someone needs to join a church family where they can grow and love and have fellowship and be a part of your mission. Lord, I pray for those who need to know you in that way, that they would make that decision and that you would move their feet in obedience to share that decision publicly as a witness to the Spirit working in them and through them. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We ask all of these things, Lord, according to your will and for your glory and your precious name. This morning as we sing our hymn of invitation, I invite you to stand. If you've made a decision to accept Christ, to rededicate yourself to Him, or to be a part of this church family, I invite you to come up. If you have something that you need to pray about, I also invite you to come. Let's sing. Praise the Lord. I'm excited. I'm not going to ask Paul to stand up. Um, but Paul Wise, is, he's been here several weeks, several months. We've been thrilled to have him. And he's decided to join our church family today. Amen. So all in favor of accepting Paul into New Hope Baptist Church, say aye. Aye. I don't ask for opposed votes. <laughs> it's that easy, brother. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, not, I'm going to ask all of you to come up and, and greet him. I'm not going to ask him to stand and do that, but please come up and uh, welcome him into our church family. We love you, brother. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your blessings. And we thank you for your compassion. Lord, and the challenge, the mission that you've given us to, to be more like you, to be a reflection of you, not just inside, but but more so outside this building, Lord, to, to take this gospel, to take 
this reflection of you, the, the spirit that's overflowing in us, take it out to a world that's in the dark and needs to see it, needs to know it. Lord, one person, one act of, a, of compassion at a time. We can change this world. You showed us how. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we give you all of the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate the offer. Thank you. I have a full communion cup too.